Oh, I'm all right, thank you, Mrs. Brown, said Peddington vaguely as he recovered himself. And I haven't been on earth, at least I have, but I didn't think I had, and it cost me two shillings. The rest of Peddington's explanations were lost as the man in the striped trousers bounded forward and shook him warmly by the paw. My dear young bear, he exclaimed, I'm the floor manager. Allow me to thank you for all you've done. That's all right, said Paddington, looking most surprised, as he raised his head. Non-stick frying pans have never been one of our most popular lines, said the floor manager, as he turned to Mrs. Brown. And as for the cleaning fluid, now look at them both. He waved his hand in the direction of the two large crowds in the distance. They're both selling like hotcakes. Since this young bear demonstrated the frying pan, our men can't wrap them fast enough. And after our other assistant removed the pancake stains from the customer's clothes, he's been rushed off his feet. Anything that gets a young bear's pancake stain out without leaving a mark must be good. You must let me know if there's anything we can do to repay you, he continued, turning back to Paddington. Paddington thought for a moment. I was doing some special Christmas shopping, he explained. Only I'm not really sure what I want to buy. It's a bit difficult for bears to see over the edge of the counters. In that case, said the floor manager, snapping his fingers, in the direction of one of the assistants, you shall have the services of one of our expert shopping advisors. She can look after you for the rest of the day, and I'm sure she'll be only too pleased to help you with all your needs. Thank you very much, said Paddington gratefully. <laughs> There's only one who can say it in that way. He wasn't at all sure what it was all about, but whatever the reason he felt certain, that with the help of anyone as important sounding as a shopping advisor, he ought to be able to get some very good Christmas presents indeed. As she bent down to pick up her shopping, Mrs. Brown caught Mrs. Bird's eye. I wish someone would tell me how Paddington gets away with it, she said. You'd have to be a bear yourself to answer that one, said Mrs. Bird wisely. And if you were, the question wouldn't arise anyway. Bears have much more important things to think about. End of chapter 6 Beginning of chapter 7 Paddington and the Christmas Pantomime Harold Price, said Mrs. Brown, Wants to see me? But I don't know anyone called Harold Price, do I? It's the young man from the big grocery store in the market, said Mrs. Bird. He said it had something to do with their amateur dramatic society. You'd better show him in then, said Mrs. Brown. Now that Mrs. Bird mentioned it, she did vaguely remember Harold Price. He was a rather spotty-faced young man who served behind a jam counter, but for the life of her she couldn't imagine what that had to do with amateur dramatics. I'm so sorry to trouble you, said Mr. Price, as Mrs. Bird ushered him into the dining room, but I expect you know there's a drama festival taking place in the hall round the corner this week. You'd like us to buy some tickets? asked Mrs. Brown, reaching for her handbag. Mr. Price shifted uneasily. Well, um, no, not exactly, he said. You see, we've entered a play for the last night, that's tomorrow, and we've been let down at the last moment by the man who was going to do the sound effects. I was told you have a young Mr. Brown who is very keen on that sort of thing, but I'm afraid I've forgotten his Christian name. Jonathan? asked Mrs. Brown. Mr. Price shook his head. No, it wasn't Jonathan, he said. It was a funny sort of name. He's been on television. 
Not Paddington, said Mrs. Bird. There's only one who can ask that question. That's it, exclaimed Mr. Price. Paddington, I knew it was something unusual. I wrote this play myself, he continued very eagerly. It's a sort of mystery pantomime. And we are hoping it may win a prize. The sound effects are most important and we must have someone reliable by tomorrow night. Have you ever met Paddington? asked Mrs. Bird. Well, no, said Mr. Price, but I'm sure he could do them, and if you come, I can let you all have free seats in the front row. That's most kind of you, said Mrs. Brown. I don't know what to say. Paddington does make rather a noise sometimes when he's doing things, but I don't know that you'd exactly call them sound effects. <laughs> Please, appealed Mr. Price, there just isn't anyone else we can ask. Well, said Mrs. Brown doubtfully, as she paused at the door, I'll ask him if you like. But he's upstairs doing his accounts at the moment, and I'm not sure that he'll want to be disturbed. Mr. Price looked somewhat taken aback when Mrs. Brown returned, closely followed by Paddington. Oh, he stammered, I didn't realize you were, uh, that is, uh, 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 I expected someone much older. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Price, said Paddington cheerfully, as he held out his paw. I'm nearly four. Bear's years are different. Uh, quite, said Mr. Price. I'm sure they are. He took hold of Paddington's outstretched paw rather gingerly. Mr. Price was a sensitive young man, and there were one or two old marmalade stains he didn't like the look of, not to mention a quantity of red ink from the debit side of Paddington's accounts, which somehow or other managed to transfer itself to his hand. <laughs> You're sure you hadn't anything else planned? he asked hopefully. Oh no, said Paddington, besides, I like theatres. And I'm good at learning lines. Well, they are not exactly actually lines, Paddington, said Mrs. Brown nervously. They are noises. Noises? exclaimed Paddington, looking most surprised. I've never heard of a noise display before. Harold Price looked at him doubtfully. Perhaps we could use you in some of the crowd scenes, he said. We're a bit short of serfs. Serfs? exclaimed Paddington. That's right, said Mr. Price. All you have to do is come on and say, odds bodykins, every now and then. Odds bodykins, repeated Paddington, looking more and more surprised. Yes, said Mr. Price, growing more enthusiastic at the idea. And if you do it well, I might even let you say gadzooks and scurvy knave as well. Perhaps would both like to go into it all down at the hall, said Mrs. Brown hastily as she caught sight of the expression on Paddington's face. A very good idea, said Mr. Price. We're just about to start a rehearsal. I can explain it as we go along. He did say it's a pantomime, said Mrs. Bird, when she returned from letting Paddington and Mr. Price out. I think he did, replied Mrs. Brown. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird. Well, if Paddington has a paw in it, there'll be plenty of pantomime. You mark my words. Here we are, said Mr. Price, as he showed Paddington through a door marked private, artists only. I'll take you along and introduce you to the others. Paddington blinked in the strong lights at the back of the stage and then sniffed. There was a nice smell of grease paint and it reminded him of the previous time he had been behind the scenes in a theatre, but before he had time to investigate the matter, he found himself standing in front of a tall, dark girl, who was stretched out on a couch. Deirdre, said Mr. Pr Mr. Price, I'd like you to meet the young Mr. Brown I was telling you about. He's promised to land a paw with the sound effects. The dark girl raised herself on one elbow and stared at Paddington. You didn't tell me he was a bear, Harold, she said. 
I didn't know myself, actually, said Mr. Price unhappily. This is Miss Flint, my leading lady, he explained, turning to Paddington. She is in bacon and eggs. How nice, said Paddington, raising his head politely. I should like to be in bacon and eggs myself. You look rather as if you had been, said Miss Flint, shuddering slightly, as she sank back onto the couch. I suppose the show must go on, Harold, but really... Mr. Price looked at Paddington again. Perhaps you'd better come with me, he said hastily, as he led the way across the stage. I'll show you what you have to do. After giving Miss Flint a hard stare, Paddington followed Mr. Price until they came to a small table. In the wings. This is where you'll be, said Mr. Price, picking up a large bundle of papers. I've marked all the places in the script where, they are, where there are any sound effects. All you have to do is bang some coconuts together whenever it says horse's hooves. And there's a gramophone for when we have any music or thunder noises. Paddington listened carefully while Mr. Price explained about the script and he examined the objects on the table with interest. It looks a bit difficult, he said, when Mr. Price had finished his explanations, especially with Paul's, but I expect it will be all right. I hope so, said Mr. Price. He ran his hands nervously through his hair and gave Paddington a last worried look as he went back onto the stage to join the rest of the cast. I do hope so. You've never had a bear doing the sound effects before. Mr. Price wasn't the only one to feel uneasy at the thought of Paddington taking part in his play, and by the time the following evening came round, everyone in the Brown household was in a high state of excitement as they got ready for their outing. Mr. Price had been as good as his word, and he had not only given Paddington a number of tickets for the family, but he'd slipped in an extra one for Mr. Gruber as well, and even Mr. Curry had promised to put in an appearance. Paddington went on ahead of the others as he had one or two last-minute adjustments to make to his gramophone. But he was waiting at the door to greet them, and they arrived just before the start of the performance. He was wearing a large rosette marked official in his hat, and he looked most important as he led the way down the crowded aisle to some seats in the front row of the stalls, before disappearing through a small door at the side of the stage. As the Browns settled down in their seats, a roll of thunder shook the hall, and Mrs. Brown <laughs> looked up anxiously. That's very odd, she exclaimed. Thunder at this time of the year. It was just starting to snow when we came in. I expect that was Paddington, testing his sound effects, said Jonathan knowledgeably. He said he had quite a few claps to do. <laughs> well, I wish he'd turn the volume down a bit, said Mrs. Burr, turning her attention to the stage as the curtain began to rise. That ceiling doesn't look too safe to me. I think someone must have forgotten to pay the electric light bill, whispered Mr. Brown as he adjusted his glasses and peered at the scene. Mr. Price's play was called The Mystery of Father Christmas and the Disappearing Plans. And according to the program, the action all took place one night in the hall of a deserted castle somewhere in Europe. From where they were sitting, the Browns not only found it difficult to see what was going on, but when but when their eyes did get accustomed to the bloom, they found it even harder to understand what the play was about anyway. This is the first part of chapter 7.